Welcome back to On The Move with Victor Shi. It is Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. This is Victor Shi. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I know a lot of us have been watching very closely, which is the craziness from the Republican Party. And we've covered it a lot on our show. But one particular incident I want to talk about is when a Republican member of Congress, one on Fox News, and accused my guest today, Representative Judy Chu, of being disloyal to the United States, We're going to talk about the increasing anti-Asian hate, much of which spewed by the Republican Party, as well as our country's broken gun laws and some other Republican craziness. And I'm grateful to be joined by um, a member of Congress who has inspired me and so many other Asian Americans and who is a relentless advocate for so many important issues. And she is, of course, Representative Judy Chu, who doesn't come too far, actually, from where I'm currently at at UCLA. It's so great to see you, Representative Chu. Oh, I think you might be on mute. There we go. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Wonderful. So I I want to start off with that incident because um, the Republican member of Congress literally called you disloyal to the United States. I'm wondering how common is, do you receive those types of comments from people who you work with in Congress? Never. I never Hmm. uh, had it. And I've been in Congress for over 13 years. Um, But what we have now is heightened uh, anti-China rhetoric. And uh, because of such things as the formation of the Select Committee on uh, U.S.-China competition, uh, now these extremist right-wing Republicans feel permission to go as far as they can to uh, point out uh, that uh, nearly every Chinese American is a spy for China. Wow. Uh, So, yeah, it was uh, outrageous. It was disgusting. But... uh, What is the worst is that it was racist because it just was built on a stereotype that uh, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans more broadly are always foreigners in their own land, no matter how much they've contributed to this country, no matter how many generations they've been here, no matter whether they've been someone like me, born here, my father fought for the U.S. Army during World War II, I taught in the community college for 20 years. I've been an elected official for 37 years, and still, I'm not American enough for them. It's so disgusting. And the representative who attacked you, actually, I mean, he was someone who voted to decertify the 2020 election. So it's if you're talking about disloyalty to the United States and our Constitution, it seems like he is more fitted for that. I'm wondering, did he ever reach out to you to uh, to apologize, or was there any type of the sort? Of course not. He he actually doubled down uh, and... uh, uh, reasserted his claims that I am disloyal and uh, spy for China in essence. Um, uh, but what was really incredible was immediately uh, there were there was so much outrage and national yeah. leaders from across the spectrum spoke out against this uh, from uh, Hakeem Jeffries to Nancy Pelosi mm-hmm. to Hillary mm-hmm. Clinton. And many organizations actually uh, came forth and uh, demanded that he apologize uh, and they were also across the spectrum from the yeah, American Jewish yeah. Council to uh, the Urban League. So um, I was very gratified about that because the thing that will save us from the, this kind of scapegoating will be the allyship between right, different groups. Right. I was just about to ask you, I mean, with this increase of anti-Asian hate, do you see kind of the way forward for just people to kind of use their voice and, and really speak out against hate in all its forms? Well, Uh, The disgusting thing about uh, these kind of accusations is they do come on uh, the last three years of anti-Asian hate. And so uh, we Asian Americans have been acutely aware of uh, how we're seen by the American public. And we are acutely aware that we're vulnerable to the stereotypes of others. And of course, it all started with the ultimate stereotype. It was uh, it was exacerbated by President Trump calling yeah. COVID-19 the China virus and even Kung flu and basically tying COVID-19 to China. And hence, those who believed him uh, believed that COVID-19 uh, was uh, engendered by anybody that they thought to be Asian. And in fact, those who were the victims of the 11,500 instances of anti-Asian hate and violence uh, over these past three years were not just Chinese. They were of all different ethnic races that were Asian American because there are many Asian, there there are many Americans, I should say, 
who cannot tell the difference between the different ethnic groups. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's sad to me that we have people in power who simply don't respect Asian Americans and our identity, but sadly we do. Is How difficult is it for you to deal with members of Congress when they don't even respect uh, or won't even respect your identity? How can you have those good faith policy, policy discussions with them, if at all? Well, there is a wide gap between um, the extremist Republicans mm -hmm. and Democrats as a whole, I would say. The extremist Republicans are following Trump lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah. And so you have uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene actually doing a rally for Trump as he was arrested yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you have uh, people like, um, uh, like this Congress member who accused me of being a spy uh, for China uh, without... Uh, any evidence of any sort uh, doing that with, without any kind of hesitation. But actually, ever since Republicans took over the House, you see example after example of extremism. For instance, I had to vote on the bill to form the Select Committee on the Weaponization of Federal Government. Yeah. yeah. Now, Jim Jordan, who's the chair of this, is being given subpoena power to just bring in anybody that he perceives to be uh, part of a conspiracy, right. whether it's Hunter Biden or the FBI or anybody. We actually call this the Select Committee on Tinfoil Conspiracies. <laughs> That is a good name for it. And I was going to ask you about, I was going to ask you about it um, later on the show, but when you mentioned, I mean, the subpoenas that he's bringing forth, first of all, Jim Jordan uh, might us remember he was subpoenaed by the January 6th committee and hasn't responded to his own subpoena. So it's laughable that he's requesting subpoena from other people. But one subpoena that really caught my attention was um, the subpoena to Alvin Bragg. And um, I think yeah. for our non-lawyer um, audience out there, I mean, is there any ability for Republicans on this committee to investigate what, you know, it seems like a local duly elected district attorney and compel him to testify? That is a good question. I mean, um, if this is an ongoing investigation, can they actually uh, compel him to come in? Uh, I mean, the, the power of the subpoena is such that you are supposed to uh, come in when, when called upon. Uh, but I think it would be the wrong move, of course, because Alvin Bragg is simply uh, enforcing the law. I mean, after all, if after all, if Michael Cohen had to go to uh, jail for cover-ups in these the, in these matters, certainly the one who is the instigator of it all yeah. should have to face uh, the court of law in terms of uh, what they did to cover up these payoff payments uh, and the, the, these these. Uh, kind of efforts to kill stories, uh, to pay, pay off, uh, these, um, uh, these, these ones with, with whom he had affairs and, and then to, uh, just kill these stories. So, uh, there needs to be, uh, a trial. There needs to be, uh, the, um, facts brought to the public and, um, uh, the president has to face uh, uh, the rule of law, just like everybody else. Yeah, I totally agree. Do you think people, at least uh, in conversations that you've had with your your um, constituents, are people kind of realizing what Republicans are doing uh, in Congress with power? Or are they, and if not, how are you trying to get that across to people um, to just kind of highlight that when Republicans are in Congress, this is kind of what happens? I think that... Uh, there are many Democrats who are pretty acutely aware that this is what's going on and uh, they um, know that there's uh, a great danger. Uh, however, I do have to say whatever Republicans are proposing in the House will be stopped by the Senate. So we yes. all have a great deal of comfort knowing that it, none of these um, uh, very draconian laws that they are uh, voting on uh, will get past the Senate mm -hmm. and nor, nor will it be uh, signed into law by uh, President Biden. I do have to say, however, that there is that um, that grouping of pro-Trump people that are out there that firmly believe whatever he says. Hmm. And so uh, they, they are still present in all our communities, including in my district. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I am blessed to have a 
uh, majority Democratic district. Uh, and uh, I actually have quite a few people who are very aware of the politics that are going on in this country and welcome uh, my comments on it. Yeah. Um, the last topic I want to I want to talk about with you is I know something that's on all of our minds, especially after the wake of Nashville um, last Monday uh, earlier this year in your district, um, which includes Monterey Park. Uh, you were your community was devastated by gun violence. Um, Republicans are still offering the same old thoughts and prayers. And at this point, what I am just kind of dying to know is, I mean, is there anything that tells you right now that Republicans actually want to do something about gun violence? And if not, is there anything that, we can, that can be done on the federal level? What gives me hope is that after Uvalde, there was a bipartisan uh, agreement, a bill that actually did pass. Uh, it did move the ball forward, even though it didn't do everything that I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it created more stringent requirements for a person under 21 to buy a gun. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it did uh, uh, crack down on gun traffickers. So um, these were good things. And I feel that um, it is the public that's going to move the needle. It's going to be the public that expresses the outrage uh, and that will uh, ultimately uh, be able to get us to be in a safe place. I think the ultimate, most important thing we must do is to ban assault weapons. Yeah. Now, this shooter who went into a Monterey Park dance studio, uh, the Star Dance Studio, had a semi-automatic pistol with a high capacity magazine. It allowed him to shoot 40 time, 40, 42 times within a matter of minutes. Wow. And he was able to kill 11 people and wound nine. And so he was able to do that much damage in such a short period of time because of assault weapons. That's why I immediately, of course, became an original co-sponsor of the assault weapons ban bill. Uh, and in fact, we've already unveiled it. It also bans high capacity magazines. We've had this ban for 10 years in this country. It was allowed to expire, but it did stop uh, many of the mass shootings that might've taken place yeah. up until that time. So that is my my ultimate goal. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, first of all, when, when you mentioned just how fast the the kind of barrels load, I mean, it's just a weapon that's meant to kill. There's no other reason why people should have it. And there was this one graphic that went viral on social media where it kind of showed when the assault weapons ban took place. There was a red line that shows when that took place and the decrease in um, gun gun violence. And then afterwards, when it expired, you saw this huge spike. So, I mean, it, it does work. But I mean, my question is still like, what will Republicans act on this? And if not, I mean, the public is overwhelmingly for common sense gun reform. But Republicans just don't kind of seem to be catching on. Is it because of money, power? What is behind their kind of decision making? Well, they are bought and paid for by the NRA, uh, the National Rifle Association. But actually, uh, the NRA does not reflect the average gun owner. Yeah. The NRA reflects the gun manufacturers. Right. They're the ones who want to market the gun so that we're in a situation right now where, where there are more guns than people in this country. Um, so uh, they want the proliferation of guns, but actually the average gun owner is much more um, common sense oriented. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, one of the bills that we must pass is the true universal background check. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Right now we have universal background checks and indeed they have done a major uh, uh, service in terms of making sure that guns are not in the hands of the most dangerous and violent people, yeah. but there are loopholes and we have to close those loopholes. The loopholes are that you can buy a gun through a private sale or on a gun show or uh, online without going through a background check. Yeah. And so those are the ones that uh, we have to make sure do go through the background check. Uh, so we do have this bill and you know what? 90% of Americans support this bill, yeah, exactly. including gun owners, because gun mm -hmm. owners do not want to see mass shootings every day, as we are having now. As of today, we've had 130 mass shootings just this year yeah. alone, just yeah. in these three months that uh, we have been in the year 2023.
it's devastating on on every level but you know i am hopeful that we have representatives like you who are in congress who are kind of pushing these bills forward and hopefully in 2024 um people will turn out and vote and and flip the house because we will need it if we want to make any progress um one last question for you which is something that i always end with with guests is um i know a lot of young people watch the show what advice do you have for young people who are thinking of going into politics maybe running for office what do you have to say to them well i hope that uh you can get involved and um, uh, see what politics is all about. Uh, now, there are numerous internship programs that uh, can put you into a district office or you can go on Capitol Hill. You can, you can uh, go right there, be in an office and see how bills are done and uh, how hearings are held, uh, what the dynamics are right there. Uh, it is really important for you just see firsthand. So it, it demystifies politics, basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's what's really good. But you can also work on a campaign. I think it's really important to see how uh, a campaign is done, what it takes to be successful in a campaign. Uh, and then you can make a decision about whether you want to run. Uh, you can, uh, in fact, um, uh, serve in, in an elected official's office. That is also another good way to see how politics are conducted, uh, you know, apply for a job in, in, in an elected person's office. Yeah. The other thing is uh, that there's a, a wonderful program that uh, uh, Congress member Jamie Raskin started. It's called the Democracy Summer. Hmm. And what he wants to do is to expose young people to what happens in campaigns, the ins and outs okay. of campaigns. So it's a, a six week democracy summer uh, mm. with a set curriculum that will also demystify campaigns. Yeah. Oh, wow. Those are all awesome. And uh, I will definitely uh, put those links in our show notes. But um, Representative Chu, thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, again, you're such an inspiration. And thank you for your voice in Congress and, and just uh, doing the good work. Um, we are all really grateful. Well, thank you, Victor. Thanks so much. Bye, Representative Chu. Okay. Bye. Well, Representative Chu is uh, a great member of Congress, like I mentioned. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we still are living in an era where people um, throw anti-Asian rhetoric across, um, especially people who are serving in power. But, um, you know, like she said, it's up to all of us to use our voices and really speak out against this because it's going to take all of us to, to really make sure that we put an end to anti-Asian hate. Just a couple of things I want to talk about before uh, we end today, and they're all for the most part, good news. Uh, the first is, as I'm sure you have all seen uh, already, uh, Wisconsin yesterday had a huge, huge, huge night. Um, as as I've talked about in this show and, and other shows and on social media, we, Wisconsin was the most important race in 2023. Uh, it was literally the the um, what was at you know, on the line was the, the difference between having a democracy and not having a democracy, women having reproductive rights versus women not having reproductive rights. The Supreme Court was split evenly among Democrats and Republicans, and this election would have uh, flipped the Supreme Court, either Democrat or Republican. And as I'm sure all of you know, the Democrat won Janet Protosiewicz. I probably but her last name, I always do. But Janet Proto was its won uh, that race in Wisconsin. She flipped the uh, Supreme Court for the first time in 15 years. I, I can't underscore how significant this is because Republicans have spent decades trying to manipulate and also hijack our courts. They've they've been largely successful. Um, but yesterday was a, a moment, I think, not only for Wisconsin, but also for our entire nation, that it's possible for Democrats to also be as successful as Republicans on the Supreme Court level. We just have to really focus, pay attention. And I wrote this one thread yesterday about my key takeaways from yesterday. There were two main takeaways. It's that Democrats, one, should not be afraid to run on abortion as well as democracy. Janet made her whole campaign about reproductive rights, gerrymandering, democracy. And I would add also, uh, as we head into 2024, gun violence would also be one of those issues for Democrats. Those three issues and even education are going to be galvanizing issues for voters. We have to be able to push back against Republicans and what they're saying about democracy, uh, reproductive rights and gun violence. I think those are the three issues that we can find common ground around and, and really mobilize people because those are the issues at the end of the day that affect all of us. Um, and there is a, such a clear contrast between what Democrats want and what Republicans want. And I think, you know, there was once a time when, when Democrats kind of shied away from 
down ballot races as well as those issues. But yesterday should be a very, very clear indication to anyone who's a part of the Democratic Party that we should make our campaigns about reproductive rights. And, and those are kitchen table issues as much as the economy is. So that was my first key takeaway. My second key takeaway was young voters again. We saw young voters really turn out at extraordinary numbers. This morning, I was reading some uh, uh, data points. And um, for instance, if you look at the Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, uh, that area, you saw 87% of the young people turn out and vote for Judge Janet uh, Protosiewicz. You saw in other areas turn out almost match that of the November 2022 election. Uh, so it's just extraordinary on so many different levels. And overwhelmingly, again, you saw in those areas more than 80% of young people turning out and voting for Democrats. This is a local Supreme Court election. That would not have been possible a, a few decades ago, a few years ago, uh, even for that matter. So for young people to do this, I think is pretty extraordinary. I think it should be a lesson for all Democrats that if you want to win, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, you know, a, a walk, a stroll, a stroll down the park, but it will take hard work. But investing in young voters is what's, is what's going to be really important. So I was very grateful for that race. I'm also really grateful for uh, Brandon Johnson winning the great state. Oh, great state. Great city. It feels like a state sometimes. Great city of Chicago. Um, Brandon Johnson is an educator. I loved his campaign. Um, and I know he, uh, you know, it's not easy being a mayor of a big city, but I think Brandon Johnson is up for the job and we'll all be paying very very, very close attention, but I do think it marks kind of a new era of leadership for Chicago. Um, and one other thing yesterday, as we have all probably seen, Donald Trump yesterday turned himself over uh, to the Manhattan DA. He was arrested. He was brought into trial. We saw some pictures of him walking from the courthouse, um, walking out of it and into the courthouse. It was pretty um, just you know, sad that we had to reach that moment in our country, but also a vindication of the rule of law still existing. So I think uh, yesterday, if you haven't seen those pictures, you should definitely check it out. Um, we saw the uh, both the charges, the, there were 34 felony charges, uh, not misdemeanors, 34 felony charges. And there were also statement of facts that really kind of put out in clear detail just what happened uh, in in uh, over these past few years and, and kind of the extent to which President Trump, uh, then President Trump and then candidate Trump hid uh, information in order to help himself politically. So uh, I'll definitely, uh, we'll, we'll have on some guests to help us, uh, you know, make sense of those. Uh, but that was, I think, a striking moment yesterday, just the fact that we had a former president of the United States actually be arrested. And uh, it was a really, really stark image, I think, for our country to pay attention that we cannot let this be the new normal. We cannot let other presidents get away with what Donald Trump has gotten away with. We cannot allow other presidents to commit the same conduct. We never want to go through this period in American history again, because it's something that doesn't bring us any good, both on the domestic and international stage. But at least the rule of law is still intact and we have some sort of accountability at long last. Um, that is all I have for you today. Uh, today is Wednesday. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode with Representative Judy Chu. Tomorrow I'll be joined by Ethan Wolf, who is uh, running Biden Wins, who is an amazing Gen Z activist. And on Friday, we're going to have on someone I know all of you love, love, love. That is Rick Wilson. We'll have on Rick Wilson to talk about um, the Republican craziness as well as just making sense of this week and uh, what we should be doing ahead of 2024. You don't want to miss any of those. Both of those will be at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, right right here on youtube.com slash Politicon. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode because we'll be here every day uh, helping you make sense of the news of the day. And thank you all again so much for watching and have a great rest of your Wednesday.